In the name of Jesus, amen. Christian author Max Lucado writes of an experience he once had as a boy. I was one of four fourth grade boys who attended Bible study each Wednesday at the church. I don't remember the teacher's name, nor do I recall any details about his life. I remember him as a large man, built like a concrete block. He wore a crew cut, neckties, and short-sleeved white shirts with an ever-present pocket protector. Was he a plumber or a postman? I have no idea. What I recall with startling detail is the evening of February 10th, 1965. He attempted to teach his handful of 10-year-old boys the meaning of the seventh chapter of Romans. That's the section in which the Apostle Paul confessed the civil war that raged within his heart. The topic was a heavy one for a covey of kids. When he talked about a troubled conscience and the need for forgiveness, I took note. I gave the teacher no reason to think the class had made an impression on me. I didn't ask any questions or thank him for his words. He likely went home with little or no understanding of the impact of the lesson. If his wife had asked, how was your class? He would have shrugged and said, I don't know. Those kids don't talk much. What he didn't know is that the freckle-faced redhead in the second row was listening. That night, I stepped into my father's bedroom and asked him about heaven. Dad took a seat on the edge of the bed and invited me to join him. He told me about God's grace. I asked Jesus to forgive me. The following Sunday, I was baptized, and a new me began. Over the years, I've thought about that teacher. He wasn't a pastor. He wasn't dynamic. He was prone to fumble over his words. He didn't have a title, seminary degree, or reserved parking place. He never filled a stadium. As far as I know, he never planted a church. He wasn't an expert on church growth or how to solve world hunger. If he left a sizable donation to a nonprofit in his will, I never heard about it. Yet his teaching rerouted my path. I've not seen him since but I've seen thousands like him. Quiet servants. The supporting cast of the kingdom of God. They seek to do what is right. They show up, open doors, cook dinners, visit the sick. You seldom see them in front of an audience. That's the last place that most of them want to be. They don't stand behind a pulpit. They make sure the pulpit is there. And they don't wear a microphone, but make certain that it's turned on. Dear friends, this week in our Red Letter Challenge, we're focused on serving. And in Matthew chapter 4, Jesus sees two fishermen in a boat, and he calls out to them, Follow me, and I'll make you fishers of men. Immediately, they left their nets and followed Jesus. And whenever I read this story, I'm just amazed at how these men were willing to leave everything behind and follow Jesus. Especially because at this point, Jesus had done no miracles. He hadn't done much of anything at this point. And so why follow him? Well, it's because of what Jesus said to them. He said, if you follow me, I'll make you become fishers of men. Now look very carefully at this promise Jesus makes to the disciples. He says that he would transform their identities and that out of that new identity would come the ability to change lives. Now the truth is, today, inside all of us, we like the idea of serving. Yet serving doesn't come naturally to us. And one of the reasons we struggle with walking in this new identity is the culture that we're in. Our culture leads us to be consumers and not contributors. We live in a culture that understands consumption but struggles with contribution. The American mindset is the customer is always right. Businesses and restaurants try to make it as easy as possible for the consumer 
to have it just the way they want it. For example, Burger King had the right idea when they started the have it your way slogan. Don't you see, we've turned into a consumer-minded nation. And unfortunately, this consumer mindset has made its way right into the church. You see, there's people who change churches constantly. They go to a church and, and they're not happy either with the preaching or the worship or the children's ministry. So what do they do? They change churches. They change churches every so often because they never find what they're looking for. Now please understand that the church isn't a business that's called to meet your every need. Rather, the church is a movement of people that's been called to serve. And guess what? You are one of those people that form the church. You have been made by God to serve and to live for something bigger than yourself. Jesus says in Matthew chapter 5, You are the salt of the earth. But if salt has lost its taste, how shall its saltiness be restored? It is no longer good for anything except to be thrown out and trampled under people's feet. You are the light of the world. A town built on a hill cannot be hidden. Neither do people light a lamp and put it under a bowl. Instead, they put it on a stand, and it gives light to everyone in the house. In the same way, let your light shine before others, that they may see your good deeds and glorify your Father in heaven. Now in this teaching, when Jesus says, You are the salt, you are the light, the Greek pronoun is in singular. It's plural. Jesus is talking to a group. And so the you is us today. Theologian John Stott once said, God intends us to penetrate the world. Our place is to be rubbed into the secular community as salt is rubbed into meat to stop it from going bad. And when society does go bad, we Christians tend to throw up our hands in pious horror. And yet one can hardly blame unsalted meat for going bad. It cannot do anything else. And so the real question for us to ask is, where is the salt? And when we talk about darkness, darkness is the absence of light. Where light does not shine, darkness dominates. And so when it comes to your faith and mine, we can be so laser focused on our own relationship with Jesus that we miss out on the fact that Christianity is a faith that is communal. And that community is called to live and love and challenge and serve the world. Jesus says in Matthew chapter 20, The Son of Man came not to be served, but to serve, and to give his life as a ransom for many. You see, we don't serve Jesus to gain salvation. Jesus has already won that reward for us. Rather, we serve to be like Jesus. You and I have the opportunity to point people to Jesus through what we do and through how we serve. And when we let our light shine with purpose, what does Jesus say? He, he says that others will see your good deeds and glorify your Father in heaven. And so serving isn't about ourselves, but it's about pointing people to Jesus and the salvation that he won for all. Now, some of you may be saying, okay, I get it, but I don't know what to do next. I don't know how to serve or where to serve. Well, think for a moment about how Jesus served others in the Bible. For instance, when the disciples tell Jesus, you don't have time for these kids. What does Jesus say? He says, let the little children come to me, for the kingdom of God belongs to such as these. For the people who were lowly, cast aside, and had needs, Jesus listened 
he visited, he helped. Just hours before his own suffering and death on the cross, Jesus washes the feet of his own disciples. And just days after he rose from the dead, we see Jesus feeding them breakfast. John 21 tells us this story where the disciples are on the Sea of Galilee when they hear Jesus calling out from the shore. When they reach the beach, they see the most extraordinary sight. Jesus is cooking for them. He invites them, come and eat breakfast. Now, when you think about this story, shouldn't the roles be reversed? I mean, Jesus had just ripped the gates of hell off their hinges. He just made a deposit of grace that forever offsets our debt of sin. He's the unrivaled commander of the universe. And here he is now wearing an apron and making breakfast. And so as we think about how Jesus served others, let's talk about how we can serve too. At the bottom of your sermon notes, there are several ideas. And the first idea that's there is, is called the attitude to the challenge. And it's important to first have a right attitude in serving. And recently I was convicted uh, over this. You have to know that about a week ago I had a communion visit with a member at a nursing home in the area. And I understood that with COVID there were going to be certain protocols in place. The visit would only be 45 minutes. We'd have to sit six, six feet apart and we'd both have to wear masks. And I knew that going in, but I'll tell you, it was extremely challenging to have that visit. Sitting six feet apart and wearing masks, I felt like I was shouting for her to hear me, and I was straining in order to hear her. And we were sitting in a very public place, so there were distractions all around us. And so towards the end of the visit, I'm thinking, man, this is the pits. My heart and attitude wasn't in the right place. And just as I was getting ready to go, this little old woman looked me in the eyes and says, I haven't received communion in more than a year. I really appreciate this visit. Thank you. You see, that visit meant the world to this woman. I left that place feeling so good at what God had done in her faith and in my heart. And so what else can we be working on this week in this challenge? Put someone else's needs ahead of your own. Serve someone who isn't able to give you anything back in return. Do something for a neighbor of yours. Show them that you care with no strings attached. Serve a child who's in your life today. Let this child know how important he or she is to you. And if you know someone who's sick, reach out to that person with a phone call, a letter, or even a visit. And this last one, you could be so creative at coming up with ways to serve. For example, you could sign up for a Habitat for Humanity build. You can volunteer at a food pantry or soup kitchen. You could clean a neighbor's yard, maybe not shoveling snow necessarily, but maybe picking up sticks. You could make your care pastor some breakfast. Bring him some donuts, right? The possibilities are endless, and you can have fun doing it. And if for whatever reason you're still struggling to find what to do, here's my advice. Find a group of people that you feel is living a life of service, that's living life on purpose, and join them. For example, here at this church, I think of the Owls ministry. They're starting up again. Look at your newsletter. Our youth ministry, the mission team, our Sunday school, just to name a few ministries. The Apostle Paul writes in Galatians chapter 5, he says, Through love, serve one another. For the whole law is fulfilled in one word. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. You see, because we're free, we can serve. In a society, in a culture that seeks to be served, we seek opportunities to serve others. 
And when we serve others, we're not just thanking Jesus for what he's done for us, but we're actually stepping into our God-given identity. And serving others brings us joy, because as we serve others out of our new identity in Christ, we fulfill our God-given purpose. And I'll tell you that nothing, absolutely nothing, fulfills you more than serving others. The reason we get so much joy out of serving others is because that's how God made you. He made you and me to serve. And so let's be excited and grateful that God would not only die for our sins and welcome us into eternal life with him, but that he would also invite you and me into a life of purpose and meaning as we go out and serve him by serving those around us. Let's do so in praise and thanksgiving to Jesus. It's in his name that we pray, praise, and give thanks. Amen.